the quickly evolving situation in the U.S. Larry, you know, you called the city that never sleeps home for the last few months and things really changed dramatically. Um, however, you had to move because it was getting a bit too risky for you. What was it like being at the center of it all? It was very strange, Vicky, because New York City is maybe the most vibrant city in the world. And I watched the streets empty. I watched the stores begin to close and uh, public transport. Basically, there was nobody. And at the same time, the rate of infection was ticking up constantly. And now the rate of infection in New York City, in New York State, is five times higher than anywhere else in the whole of the United States. As of today, there's been just under 30,000 people care, um, who have been infected by coronavirus in, in New York State. Um, in New York City alone, 52,000 in the whole state. And now the U.S. government is considering a curfew similar to what Kenya has done. They're considering a curfew in New York City, in New York State, but also in the neighboring states of Connecticut and New Jersey. So it's becoming quite serious. And I didn't think for me it made sense to remain in that city, which is really densely populated and people are in each other's space all the time. It made sense to step away for a little bit. Unbelievable. And, you know, we didn't see those numbers. I didn't anticipate for them to explode in that way. What do you make of the response by the U.S. government so far? You just mentioned a curfew for New York. So there's been a lot of... Uh, messaging around social distancing similar to kenya which is stay away from public spaces if you can as much as possible stay home work from home as you can i realize that's not always possible in kenya where some people leave um, on day-to-day -day wages they have to go to work and so in the u.s the messaging like almost everywhere else in the world is stay at home as much as possible and do not get anywhere near contact with somebody else because you don't know who's infected, but also if you're infected, you, you don't risk infecting somebody else. And beyond that, there is a real concern about the capacity of the medical system to deal with a huge upsurge in infections. And that's why people stay at home to help flatten the car. If fewer people are infected, the medical services can deal with it. And for me, as somebody who's got people who work in the, in the who are healthcare professionals who work in uh, hospitals both in kenya but also here in the us and in the uk i'm constantly worried about them when they go home when they go to work and are they going to come back safe and healthy and so like everyone else i'm watching this and worrying and hoping that everything is going to be fine they're going to be fine Right. And, you know, as we observe this, of course, away from the viral infections um, is also the business impact. Economies have been hit hard. And of course, New York has been regarded as the financial capital of the world. Uh, from your perspective and your observations, you know, what is going on there? So it's almost guaranteed there's going to be a recession in the United States. Just the, if you look at the last, the most recent um, un un unemployment claims in the last week alone, they jumped to an all-time record. Three million people filed for unemployment. Before that, the record was about 600,000. That's just here because that data is tracked. But if you were to do a similar exercise in Kenya, I think that the number would be just as serious. I know people who are telling me I haven't had any work in Nairobi for the last so long. Um, my first job coming out of uh, high school, I used to work in my um, aunt's place that sold tea in Gikomba. So that's a very informal economy. It's a big, powerful one, but it's usually informal. They don't track the data. I know all those people who work hard and they have to be out there and be come by every day. Otherwise, they don't have something to eat. Um, I grew up partly in Kisumu. So I know the people who live in Nyalenda and Obunga and Manyata, they have to be out there earning the daily keep. They have to be out there supporting their families. And so the curfew obviously complicates matters for them. I feel um, how hard it is. It's easy to, to criticize if you're on Twitter and you have a job that allows you to work from home and you're guaranteed of your monthly paycheck. But for those who have to be out there to do a daily job to make their living, that's how they can feed themselves and their families. It's very easy to criticize and say, oh, why are they not home at 7 p.m.? Because the curfew has begun. But this is their life. They don't have the luxury of a car. They don't have all of the things that people on Twitter and Facebook take for granted. And so the impact on them is going to be significant. The U.S. is giving almost every family, every single person, a check of $1,020. That's about 120,000 shillings. A cash transfer in Kenya, for instance, that would touch people who, whose lives have been changed, who are suffering from this, I think would be great. But obviously the funding for that would have to come from somewhere. I'm not sure if it's something the government has considered.
Right. And, you know, this situation and, and the curfew, by and large, has kind of exposed the inequities in our society that have been there. Um, but kind of piggybacking on what you were talking about, the curfew and the impact, a byproduct has been the cases of police brutality that we witnessed uh, yesterday. Oh, what's your take on what's happening back here at home? I was horrified, Vicky, watching the people getting brutalized by the police um, and trying to cross the ferry. And, and first of all, there's the obvious risk of infection when you have a lot of people in close quarters. They're held there. Um, in this kind of pen situation, which was just really outrageous. But the fact that the people who are supposed to protect us are out there um, beating us up is something that I think the government should be talking a lot more seriously about, the minister in charge, the cabinet secretary, whoever. You can't have police who are supposed to be to Michi Kwawate, and it's now called a service, not a force, but in every single way they are a force. And you're beating some of the poorest, hardworking Kenyans. And how do you justify that? And so I saw all sorts of people, especially privileged Kenyans on social media, saying, why were they out there? Why were they not at home? And you don't realize it's speaking from a point of privilege, but also this sort of brutality where I don't know if it is contempt that the government holds for us as Kenyans. I don't know if it is contempt that the police have for us. It's a lack of respect that you get somebody out of the car or trying to cross the ferry and you beat them up and you hold them in this very dehumanizing and dignified position. It's an outrage, and every Kenyan should basically condemn it. It's it should not allowed. It should not be allowed to go on. And I've been saying this. I remember in 2017 when we were covering the election with UVT, and people were saying, "Oh, the people that police are beating up in different parts of the country, they deserve it." And I said, "This will come to you, and you won't have anybody to speak up for you." In 2007, people were getting shot by police, and others were justifying it. But this is a circle that goes around. Eventually, it will come to you, and there will be nobody speaking up on your behalf. So. Every single Kenyan of conscience should be looking at this and getting horrified that this is something that's allowed to go on without any serious condemnation and without consequences. It's unacceptable. Absolutely. And, and Larry, before I let you go, my last question, you know, as the virus is moving across the world, there's also an issue of misinformation um, also having a viral effect as well. People are calling it an infodemic. You know, how do we kind of get ahead of it? Because you're finding people getting caught up. WhatsApp groups are exploding with a lot of fake news. How do people become, for lack of a better term, their own fact checkers? So I've been doing battle even on my own family WhatsApp group because I think a lot of people have this tendency of just you see something and you forward it. The more dangerous, the more scary, the better. And then you share it to 10 people on WhatsApp and they will share it to another 10 people. And then all of a sudden it's this um, huge viral thing. And you're not caring to, you're not caring to fact check it. I called out a friend of mine on, on Facebook today because he was posting pictures of what is supposed to be police brutality, which obviously I condemn. But these were Boniface Mwangi's pictures from 2007. And they were like, this is how the government is fighting COVID-19. And I'm like, you, sh you're, you, you should know better. You should not be misleading people like this and helping this infodemic grow even, even further. So before you share something, maybe you want to fact check that. You want to see if any credible news all right it seems we have lost larry unfortunately uh but hopefully we can get him to take us to break that was the plan initially you are watching citizen weekend but great insights from him on the situation in the u.s we're taking a short break however we'll be having dr kariuki njenga he's an infectious disease specialist he's been following coronaviruses for close to two decades now he's ready to take your questions so remember to uh, tag us on hashtag Citizen Weekend at Citizen TV Kenya and of course our SMS line 22422. Stay with us. We'll be back.